Today is the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. We have two commemoration days mass. And the commemorations we make, we make with the collect, the secret, and the post communion. The first that of St. Francis, uh, the impression of the uh, stigmata of St. Francis. Uh, and the second is with the uh, suffrage of the suffrage of the saints. Uh, St. Francis uh, received the stigmata uh, having the same wounds on his hands, feet, and side as uh, our Lord himself, just as St. Paul did. Uh, and when one has those wounds, what I've read is that uh, the, the pain is excruciating, and uh, also, of course, Padre Pio had the stigmata as well, but it's something that one does not necessarily pray for and ask to have, but uh, it's usually given to those who are especially spiritual uh, and uh, will offer it up in reparation uh, for the sins of mankind. The epistle appointed for today's Mass is taken from the epistle of St. Paul to the Galatians, chapter 5, verses 25 and 26, through chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. Brethren, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be made desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, and if a man be overtaken in any fault, you who are spiritual instruct such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and you shall also you shall fill, fulfill the law of Christ. For if any man think himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let everyone prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only, and not in another. For everyone shall bear his own burden, and let him that is instructed in the word communicate to him that instructeth him in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for what things a man shall sow those also shall he reap. For he that soweth in the flesh of the flesh also shall reap corruption. But he that soweth in the spirit of the spirit shall reap life everlasting. And in doing good, let us not fail, for in due time we shall reap not failing. Therefore, well, whilst we have time, let us work good to all men, but especially to those who are the household of the faith. The gospel appointed for today's Mass, saving the gospel of St. Luke, chapter 7, Verses 11 through 16. At that time, Jesus went into a city called Naim, and there went with him his disciples and a great multitude. When he came nigh to the city, behold, a dead man was carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city were with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said to her, Weep not. And he came near and touched the bier, and they that carried it stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother, and there came a great fear on them all. They, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet is risen up amongst us, and God hath visited his people. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. For if any man think of himself to be something, whereas he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Let every one prove his own work, and so he shall have glory in himself only. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I've been giving a series of sermons, and I'd like to sort of continue on. And this Sunday, I'd like to go back and not so much reminisce, but point out some of the reformers of the early church, uh, back in the 1600s and, and, and since then, up to this point in time, not so much to, to drag their name out and, and the evil that they did, but to point out what they did, that we, when we see in our own time, we can recognize what happens, what, recognize what it is. When we actually go to look at the Novus Ordo, we can see a parallel, a similarity, and uh, enables to understand what is happening around us. For oftentimes people will say, well, what on earth is happening? What's going on? Can't they see? All the expressions, can't they see what they're doing? Don't they understand? Well, let's do that. Also, too, I'd like to just cover some of these things so that if you, you should ever come into a discussion, you have some background understanding uh, of the church, the mind of the church in this matter. Um, but you go back and look at the various churches over the past 400 years that has been established. To one degree or another, one way or another, uh, they will claim, uh, either directly or indirectly, that they will claim that they're founded by Almighty God. 
by, by our Lord. By our Lord because they would call themselves Christian. Uh, however, the only one can call themselves Christian, uh, founded by Christ, uh, is the Catholic Church. Say what you want. It's the only one, and one can offer proof. Uh, significantly, history uh, points an unwavering finger at the strictly human origin of all the other Christian churches. Uh, one even only needs to go to the library, I suppose nowadays the internet. Uh, but go to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Go to the Encyclopedia Americana. Go to Compton's Encyclopedia. A number of the old names from years ago. Nowadays, there's a tendency uh, that they will scrub history, especially in the encyclopedias, they'll scrub history of what history really is. Uh, and so, nowadays, they, they try to, to, to cleanse it of all truth and put on their spin to it. But go back to some old encyclopedias of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s, if they're available back uh, at that point in time. And you'll find a number of things as this. For example, if you look at the Russian Orthodox Church, Orthodox means without error. It means uh, it's, it's the true thing. It's, it's without, it's, it's the, the full substance of the doctrine is there. But look at the Greek Russian, Ortho, or the Russian Orthodox. And what do you see there? Who founded it? Our Lord Jesus Christ? Of course not. It was a, a fellow by the name of Michael Chilarius. He, he founded this church. Uh, look at the various Protestant denominations. The Lutherans, who founded their church. Well, they named him after the founder, Luther. Uh, then there's the Calvinists. Who founded them? John Calvin. Uh, Anglicans, or Episcopalians in the United States, their founder was King Henry. John Knox founded the Presbyterian. John Wesley founded the Methodists. Robert Brown, the Congregationalists. John Smith founded the Baptists. William Miller founded the Seventh-day Adventists. Joseph Smith, of course, the Mormons. Mary Eddy Baker, Christian scientists. All of, every one of these I mentioned goes back to this or that particular founder. Every one of them, uh, whether they are strictly so-called Christians or either pseudo-Christians, such as the Mormons or the Christian scientists, um, or the Jehovah Witness was a John Russell, uh, everyone was, every one of them was a human being. They're claiming Christianity, but they were the founder of a religion. They didn't come in with the aspect of uh, saying they had to reform. They couldn't, in all sincerity, uh, in Christian sincerity, uh, say they're divinely inspired to found their respective church because God and the person of the blessed and our Lord Jesus Christ pledged that the original Christian church would be that which he founded, which would carry on his work, which uh, history points to being the Catholic church. There's only one church. Christ didn't find many churches. He only founded one church uh, that would enjoy his sanction and his protection. Now, if you look at the various reformers, of the various denominations, the various founders of various religions. Uh, none of these people possessed any really personal qualification that would entitle them, according to God's justice, such, uh, such extreme high honor that they were to found uh, the, the founding and establishment of a religious order operating under God's auspices. I, I want to say that the popular perception, legend, whatever you want to look at it, built up around these various founders of these various religions 
One thing you will do, you will detect, you will notice, you will find out that none of these men ha had uh, heroic piety, moral virtue, that they were submissive to divine will, which is usually a pre a prerequisite requisite, uh, to receiving some uh, assignment from Almighty God, as in the Old Testament, whether it was Job or Isaiah or any of the prophets. We look at these various founders. Take, take, take Martin Luther. I pick at him because he was one of the first ones. I, I choose him, not because... He was just somebody, he was a Catholic. He was a Catholic, Catholic priest, Catholic monk. Uh, he just wasn't there to reform the church and purge out errors. Uh, he wasn't really a man of any exemplary Christian virtue. According to that which we read, the legend of Martin Luther, according to his contemporaries, that which was written about him, actually just what Martin Luther himself said. He definitely declared that he was not anything of an exemplary manner. In his diary, in his diary, which is in, 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 uh, in existence, Martin Luther wrote this significant characterization of himself. He says, why do I sit soaked in wine? He says, to be content and chaste is not in me, he said. Not did only Luther confess himself to be shamefully immoral, but he, ha he was blasphemous, ac accusing Christ of the same thing. In his table talks, if you go look, his, his table talks are quite, quite famous or infamous, I guess we'd say, uh, that those who sit around with him would record some of the things he said, and mostly... If there's anything that is borderline, at best, borderline coarse, uh, it's usually printed and written in Latin itself because of what he said. But one thing he did say, he said, Christ, Christ, he said, committed adultery. Committed adultery. First off, with a woman that was about the, the, about the well, whom John tells us, Secondly, Luther says, secondly, that Mary is with Mary Magdalene, and thirdly, with the woman caught in adultery, uh, whom he said, whom he dismissed so lightly. Can you imagine someone accusing Christ of such a thing? That's the accusation today. That's the accusation today, uh, if you've read anything at all in this matter. Thus, even Christ, who is so was the son of God without sin, according to Luther, was guilty of fornication before he died. Not only did Luther challenge the purity of our Lord, the son of God, he challenged the very veracity of the Ten Commandments. In a lecture that he gave at Wittenberg, he counseled his followers, followers, he said this, he says, if Moses should attempt to intimidate you with the stupid Ten Commandments, tell him right out to chase yourself to the Jews. He was the reformer of the religion at that point in time. He thought he was a reformer. He declared himself to be a reformer. No, no doubt Luther felt that this sentiment was necess a necessary complement to his new doctrine of justification by faith alone. What Luther said on that, he says, sin boldly, but believe more boldly. He said, let your faith be greater than your sins. It is enough for us through the riches of the glory of God to have known the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Sin will not destroy us in the reign of the Lamb, although we were, committed, who were to commit fornication or murder a thousand times in one day. He wrote that to Melanchthon at that point in time. When the occasion called for it, Luther, Luther could uh, speak most eloquently on Christian morality. And of course, he is known to be the great reformer. Even, even and this is where I want to start making some comparisons, uh, even Francis, Pope Francis of the New Church, uh, spoke eloquently of Luther and has a statue of him someplace in Vatican City. The, the, 
the great reformer. Uh, so we see that. Then you take King Henry, King Henry VIII. He was, I would say, probably the second most leader in the revolt against the Catholic Church. He was, he was a man of exemplary Christian virtue, submissive to the will of God. But the things changed. Things changed. Uh, according to his biographers, biographers, he was not so radical as Luther in a doc doctrinal point of view, as was Queen Elizabeth, who followed him, who Protestantized the doctrinal structure of the Anglican Church. But his favorite pastime, King Henry VIII's favorite pastime, was marrying every girl that caught his royal fancy. He married how many times? Six, five, six times, whatever the number was. And then King Henry would behead those who dared to question his right to do so. Not only would those subjects lose their head uh, in the guillotine for questioning his morality of his matrimonial uh, excursions, uh, they would lose his, their heads for questioning his right to choose the religion for them. It's been reliably estimated that over 10,000 people suffered martyrdom, usually by the sword, or excuse me, by the guillotine, uh, during his reign for refusing to forsake their Catholic religion in favor of this new state-instituted uh, religion. Hence, you'll find uh, English historians saying that it was not the gospel of Jesus Christ which converted England to Anglicanism, but the guillotine of King Henry VIII and the dungeons of Queen Elizabeth. And to tell you what history would, people would like to watch, whitewash history, they, was, they would refer to Queen Elizabeth I as good Queen Beth, good Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Mary, who tried to restore that which King Henry destroyed, the Catholic faith, she's called Bloody Mary. Uh, because she did execute uh, some of those who were trying to uh, destroy the Catholic faith. But those that she executed were those who turned against or tried to subvert the Catholic faith. Good Queen Beth, it should be the term should be uh, Bloody Elizabeth, she likewise, like King Henry, executed thousands because of the Catholic faith. Such that... Uh, Cardinal Gasquet, or Abbot Gasquet, speaking uh, given in a sermon in 1917, said that uh, Catholic England became Protestant England in one generation. In 20 years, it became uh, England, the Catholic Kingdom of England became Protestant king, Kingdom. And then, of course, you have the various other ones as well. Uh, John Calvin, uh, the great Puritan, the great Puritan, Purity. He, he was known to be the Puritan. He started the Puritan religion. Uh, he made Switzerland, the, state, the Puritan religion, the state religion of Switzerland. And he invoked the penalties for those who differed with him, uh, personally uh, directing the burning at the stake of various others who had issue with his decrees. He likewise sent thousands to prison uh, for the flight, slight offense because of his purity, he wanted to be so pure, he sent them to prison for dancing or playing cards or eating fish on Friday. One, I was reading one could even go to prison in this new land of enlightenment in Switzerland for keeping company with someone who was found guilty of these offenses by association. And it was said that if you associated or caught in company of a Catholic, or even saying anything complimentary about the Catholic Church, uh, it was it invariably meant a life term in prison. Then, of course, you have John Knox. He, uh, he, uh, he was an excommunicated Catholic priest, gone theolog uh, theologically uh, berserk, crazy. Uh, he lost his morals. And he likewise started his own religion in Scotland, Presbyterianism. Uh, then you have Calvin, you have 
there is, if anyone looks at the scrutiny at the various Protestant fathers, probably the only one that, uh, who was really honest to goodness, having Christian piety in his own way and had some moral integrity, who actually could be called the reformer was John Wesley. But in the case of John Wesley, he didn't want to reform the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the Anglican Church. He didn't want to start a new religion. He only wanted to unify the, uni the, unify the church of his convictions and preserve the be best features of the Catholic an ancestry. Uh, so he was a reformer of the Anglican religion within even a decade or so of uh, King Henry and uh, his followers. So when we look at all these things, it's not to say that there were not immoral clerics in the Catholic Church. In the Middle Ages, you had a few popes who bribed their way into the papacy. Uh, you had them practicing one immorality of one kind or another. At one point, there's even three popes contending to be pope uh, at that point. But we look at these, and the church never admits that in the long history that you find bishops who are corrupt, uh, living in ostentatious luxury, uh, making a disgraceful spectacle of themselves one t way or another. One could even say, uh, certainly, she, the Catholic Church has produced countless saints but on the other hand, it isn't, it isn't an exclusive society of holy saints. If it were, we would have confession. If her members were purely without sin, could never resist sin, there would be no need for confession. It would have been dispensed with a long time ago. But the point is, the point is that even in the Catholic Church, there are those who are rotten and corrupt, but we have those who, when they want to, they want to go back to the church and go back to confession and get back into the grace of Almighty God. Uh, like I mentioned one other time, and I think it might have been one of the articles in the back of the bulletin, that no one ever left the church, established a new church, no one ever left the Catholic Church in order to become more holy. They never left the Catholic Church, says, I must leave this church that I might become a saint. Likewise, uh, one can say that no one ever said, well, I'm going to stay away from confession because I want to become a saint, so I've got to stay away from confession. I'm not going to go to the sacraments because I've got to become holy, so I'm not going to go to Holy Communion. I'm not going to go to confession because I want to become holy. I want to become a saint. You'll never find that. You'll never find that. What we must remember is that God would never inspire men to reform his church who they themselves were in need of reformation. If you find wicked people in the upper echelons of the church, which we see particularly in our own day, uh, that has nothing to do or is in any way connected with the founding of the Catholic Church. If anything, we look at all of the cardinals' dowdays, the various so-called popes, the, the various popes of the new church. Uh, they're trying to reform. They're trying to reform. And we only have to start looking at their lives. And they're not the, the chosen reformers to reform the Catholic Church. We look at real reformers of the church. When there was uh, evil people in the church, we will find that they were saints, whether it's St. Dominic, St. Francis, uh, even Pope Pius, the, the Pope Pius X. His motto was to restore. Restore was not to eliminate and destroy, but was to restore that which the church has always done. Uh, so far as when we see the evils taking place today, uh, the Catholic Church is not responsible for what they're doing. The Catholic Church is responsible for the doctrines and preserving the doctrines. And if one wants to be Catholic, one does not throw out the doctrines of the Catholic Church, but rather one reinstitutes them, and one follows them and practices them and upholds them. And this is what the Catholic Church is. The Catholic Church is in no way liable for the spirit and the worship 
of the new Catholics, the, the, the so-called Novus Soto Church. The Catholic Church is not liable for what they do. Those who are liable are liable because they themselves have left the doctrines and have embraced new beliefs, new doctrines, new practices, and have made new laws supporting this new religion which they profess. And that is something we can look at at another sermon. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.